Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Joe Guido, CEO of Verdera Surgical, and I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. We are lucky enough to have some of the premier thought leaders in radiation oncology presenting tonight, and I'd like to introduce them now. First, Dr. Shrag Shah, who's the co-director of Comprehensive Breast Program and director of breast radiation oncology at the Cleveland Clinic, and Dr. David Beyer, former president of Astro and current medical director of Cancer Center Centers of Northern Arizona. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you may type your questions in the chat box and we will try to address as many as we can at the end. Thank you, and with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Shaw. Thanks, Joe. Um, and you know, I really appreciate everyone joining. Uh, it's late on the East Coast and right after work on the West Coast. So I'm Shrag Shah, a radiation oncologist who specializes in breast cancer. And I'll be talking a little bit about radiation therapy in 2022, rethinking the target and the case for less fractions. So, you know, a lot of this information I think is probably well known to most people on the call, but when we think about breast conserving therapy, equivalent local control and survival was seen as compared to mastectomy, though almost all those trials had radiation therapy. And what we've seen over the years is increased rates of local recurrence. And when you look at meta-analyses, increased rates of breast cancer mortality with the omission of radiation. And we've yet to find a population that does not benefit from radiation with respect to local control. Breast radiation has evolved, and I would argue that in the last 10 years, breast radiation has evolved more than it evolved in the previous 30 to 40 years. And it's evolved with respect to both targets and fractionation. So when I started practicing, I think most patients I saw got whole breast radiation. It's what was used in the randomized trials. And by and large, most patients got standard fractionation. We were beginning to use hypofractionation, but we weren't really sure who it was appropriate for. So a lot of women were getting 50 and 25 or 45 and 25 whole breasts followed by a five to eight fraction boost. We started to see hypofractionation emerge in the early 2010s, um, either based on the START-B regimen of 40 and 15 or based on the Ontario trial of 42 and 16. Over the past three years, we've seen an evolution even further in whole breast radiation with the idea of ultra short whole breast radiation based on the FAST and FAST forward trials, which I'll discuss a little bit later. But this has now transitioned radiation therapy for appropriate patients down to five treatments given either once weekly or in five days. With respect to targets, we've seen an evolution from the idea of whole breast radiation therapy to partial breast with multiple techniques available, including brachytherapy, external beam radiation therapy, and it, with respect to external beam, both 3D and IMRT. With regards to boost, and we've also seen an evolution. I think if you were to think back 10, 15 years ago, most women underwent a lumpectomy, also underwent a boost. Um, that being said, we're seeing declining use in the utilization of boost over time. And I think this is cognizant of the fact that we're seeing data, one that suggests not all patients benefit the same with respect to absolute benefit from a boost, as well as guidelines that support omitting boost in low-risk patients. One of the things I often tell people that I work with in trainees is that if I'm considering not radiating a patient, I probably shouldn't be considering boosting a patient. With respect to hypofractionation, as I mentioned, there's multiple randomized trials with long-term follow-up. We have the START A and B trials, the OCOG trial, the Royal Marsden experience, as well as early data from the MD Anderson trial showing no difference in local control, survival, or toxicities with hypofractionation as compared to standard fractionation. And this is typically considered what we call moderate hyper hypofractionation. The schedules use 15 or 16 fractions at 2.66 gray per fraction and reduce treatment from five to six weeks to three to four weeks. And importantly, this is still the standard of care for most patients with early stage breast cancer per current guidelines. But what about ultra short? And really two regimens have come out. One is the FAST regimen. And it's important to recognize that FAST compared standard fractionation with once weekly. And part of that was that FAST was started before we had long-term data from start A and B. This study was not powered to look at local control. It only had a little bit less than 1,000 patients, around 900 or so. But what we did see at 10 years was no difference in normal tissue effects with the 28.5 gray arm as compared to the standard fractionation. Overall, in all three arms with 900 plus patients, there was only 11 recurrences that were well balanced between the arms. Fast forward was published in The Lancet about two years ago and compared hypofractionated whole breast radiation versus five fraction given five days in a row. Interestingly, no difference in ipsilateral tumor recurrence was seen at five years. We did not see differences in the 26 gray arm, but we did see in the 27 gray arm. And to be honest, I am a bit skeptical of how one gray difference over five fractions can lead to 
one regimen having no difference in side effects and another having statistically worse moderate marked effects. So that's certainly something we're going to have to wait for the 10-year data to see how that one gray translates. One hypothesis is that this is due to the very steep dose response curve seen at this point um, on the alpha beta curves, and that may be why, but I don't think that's clear clinically, particularly given that we see heterogeneity in treatment planning when we do whole breast radiation. With regards to partial breast radiation, these are the, the trials that have been published with long-term follow-up. Since this table, the Hungarian trial has now been published with 20-year follow-up. So what we can say with partial breast is we really have good data. We have you know 10-year data from Florence, 10-year data from B39, eight-year data from Rapid, really showing really no difference, or in the case of B39, a marginal difference in recurrence between partial breast and whole breast. And we have two sets of guidelines, as well as guidelines from the ASBS, supporting the role of partial breast irradiation in appropriately selected patients. So where does Viriform play into all of this? And the idea behind Viriform is that it's really a proprietary polypropylene radio opaque blend that allows for permanent marking. Um, and what's nice about it is you don't see wayward clips like you do when, when we play surgical clips. It's a continuous um, way to identify the tumor bed cavity in three dimensions. It allows for us to use image guidance. Um, and just you know, for the purpose of disclosure, we actually have an ongoing study at the Cleveland Clinic looking at this uh, as part of partial breast irradiation. And what you can see here is kind of typical lumpectomy cavity. You don't want me as a radiation oncologist doing this. Um, but what we see um, is really that the surgeon is going to start, they're going to set the length and go to the bottom of the cavity, and they're going to create the base of the cavity, and then start taking small bites kind of in a almost circular continuous fashion, uh, allowing for, as you can see, a pattern that is actually very easy to see on cone beam CT, um, which I'll show you in a few minutes on one of my patient's uh, cases, where you can actually delineate uh, this cavity in three dimensions. Once that's done, the surgeon can close as they normally do. So I've mentioned partial breast, but the other question is, how do we do boost? And, you know, for me, I typically think about patients to boost as women under the age of 50 who have high-grade tumors, positive margins, and some consideration for estrogen negative or triple negative status. With DCIS, typically younger women with high-grade disease, close margins. And we've typically used seromas and clips. And as anyone who's contoured a seroma can tell you that there's a huge amount of variability, one, in contouring seromas, but also you see clips and you're not sure oftentimes if that clip is part of the seroma, whether you should cover it. Um, I often struggle with upper outer quadrants where it's a single incision um, and the axillary sentinel clips may be right next to the upper outer quadrant seroma clips. Um, and one of the things we've seen consistently with radiation is that target volumes, the size of volumes correlate with toxicity such as fibrosis and telangiectasias. So the more precise we can be in our target delineation, the less risk of toxicity. This image is a comparison of clips which are seen in green and aviriform. The other challenge that I think all of us as radiation oncologists are facing is oncoplastic surgeries. And typically speaking, if I don't have something like a aviriform in place to show me the cavity, I'm not really able to boost because the clips may be spread throughout the whole breast. Uh, the scar is no longer a surrogate for the lumpectomy cavity. Um, and so I'm left with either having something to clearly delineate the area or omitting boost, even for example, in a young woman with triple negative breast cancer. Shifting gears, the question is, how do we take all of this information and data and really think about the impact of payment reform with respect to radiation therapy? And, you know, we have new models on the horizon. The APM is delayed till 2023 and maybe delayed even further, depending on kind of where things go. But whether we like it or not, payment reform is on the horizon for our specialty. Um, and if you look at, for example, breast cancer uh, in the APM, the base case rate was $12,060 with certain adjustments uh, made. And that includes everything planning, physics, dosimetry, image guidance, treatment delivery, everything. And it includes 3D, IMRT, SBRT protons, image guidance, all included. And depending on your current fractionation scheme, this could really lead to a potential revenue decrease because regardless of fractionation, you're gonna be paid the same. And I think it's important, right? We may say that the APM is gonna be delayed, may not come about, but no matter what new models are coming, payers are seeing the writing on the wall and saying, we want to value, really value propositions over volume. So how can we as radiation oncologists use data to provide greater value to our patients, understanding the cost of delivering therapy is going up per fraction. So if it's costing us more to deliver fractions and there's data supporting less fractions, 
is it time to consider using less fractions? And it's my take that incorporating five fraction regimens earlier will allow for easier transition to these new models. So with respect to these new models, there's really a couple ways to think about it. And five fraction partial breast is how I really started thinking about five fraction breast radiation as a whole. Um, the group at the University of Florence has done a wonder job, wonderful job with a randomized trial comparing 30 and five given every other day on this trial to 50 and 25 with a boost. And um, 30 and five really does model out to about 50 and 25 with a boost. 520 patients, so a relatively small randomized trial compared to some of the others. But now with 10 year data published in the JCO, no difference in ipsilateral breast recurrence and reduced acute and chronic toxicities with partial breast. And we think about how th we do things at the Cleveland Clinic. This is a scan from a patient who had a partial breast on and you can see the viriform and it's different points which really help delineate the cavity. We do our simulation with ABC regardless of laterality. This helps reduce heart and lung dose, but also decreases best breast motion for partial breast cases. We typically do about a one to one and a half centimeter expansion on this compared to about two centimeters with the Livy trial. The Livy trial didn't mandate any kind of respiratory management and it allowed for, but didn't mandate cone beam CT. With our five fraction protocol, we typically give our treatment daily. We started with every other day like the Florin trial, but we've shifted to daily. And that's, I think, consistent with the OPAR trial, which was published at Astro, showing really no difference between daily versus every other day. We do daily cone beam CT, and we've shown in our data about 77% of patients have no skin changes and cardiac doses are very low. And this is just really showing how we identify the target. On the image on the top, you can see a cavity and a wiring of the scar, and then you can see a clip all the way on the chest wall. And I wouldn't know how to contour that for partial breast. Should I cover that? That's a huge increase in breast volume. Do I not cover that? Is that an area at risk? Um, and it's really, the key is good target delineation to delivering partial breast. And you want consistency. I think one of the hard things we see in these is there's barely a lot of inconsistency. Um, so if you look at the next picture farther down, you can see a viriform really highlighting the edge of the seroma. And then finally, you can see what it looks like in actually real-time image guidance. So why continuous markings advantageous is you can use it for cone beam CT alignment. So you can use tight margins and do cone beam CT and align to your target volume quite well. Shifting gears a little bit to, to five fraction whole breast, this is some of the data from the FAST trial, 900 patients really, you know, relatively low risk patients, over 50, T1 to T2, N0. Um, no boosts were allowed on this trial. Um, and really the three arms I previously mentioned with the primary endpoint of photographic appearance at 10 years, no difference between the 28.5 and 50 gray arms with increased uh, moderate to marked side effects in the 30 gray. And as I said, only 11 recurrences total. And this is just uh, a figure from the study basically showing those assessments and showing that 50 and 28.5 are quite comparable. This is fast forward. It was a much larger trial, about 4,100 patients, non-inferiority, three arm design, really low rates of recurrence. And I just speak, this speaks to really how hard it's gonna be to do breast trials moving forward. We've gotten quite good at reducing rates of recurrence, but that means to see differences in regimens require larger and larger studies. So about a 2.1% rate of recurrence at five years with 40 gray um, and actually reduced rates though within um, the non-inferiority thresholds for the other two arms but worse moderate effects with the 27 gray arm and no difference with the 26 gray arm. And this is again, just a figure showing um, ipsilateral breast tumor occurrence for in the arms and really showing um, no difference. So how do we do things at the clinic with five fraction whole breast? Well, um, with the FAST, there was no boost. It was FAST forward, there's only about 25%, but that adds another five to eight fr fractions. And I, I have to be honest, I'm a bit perplexed at why I would give you know, five to eight fractions of boost if I'm only giving five fractions of the whole breast. So what we've started doing at the, at the Cleveland Clinic is actually doing simultaneous integrated boost. So we give 26 gray and five fractions of the whole breast while doing a simultaneous cavity boost where we use, for example, either Eclipse or in this case, the, the Viriform, we contour it out and we actually plan that as a basically 0.8 gray per fraction boost to a total of 30. And we typically do that with either on FOSS electrons ideally, um, or in some cases, mini tangents um, to deliver uh, the SIB boost. We don't do IMRT, we just do 3D conformal for these cases. And so when it comes to Viriform versus Clips, you know, the question is, well, if I had my preference, what would I want? Um, and you know, I, I trained using Clips. I've used Clips for the majority of my practicing career. Uh, you know, obviously I've used them for years. I'm comfortable as is Dr. Byer. But we've all run into those challenges. In most cases, you see, you have to you see a wayward clip and you got to see if there was another biopsy performed, if that clip migrated. Certainly, I can't use them in oncoplastics. And even 
When I've tried to use clips, for example, with triggered imaging for targeted radiation, it's very hard to do image guidance. On the flip side, Viriform, as I mentioned, you know, it's a radio-opaque blend, it's continuous, it has no metal, it allows for 3D, you know, really delineation. It allows for great comb beam CT. It's one of the easier things for comb beam to look at. Um, and nicely, after treatment's over, it makes it easy to do follow-up. You don't have any issues post-treatment with post-treatment mammograms, ultrasounds, or MRIs. So one of the questions is, how do we incorporate this into our practice? And the idea is, really, it starts with a discussion with your colleagues. Um, these are the things that I've discussed with my breast surgical colleagues, my medical oncology colleagues, as well as my own radiation oncology partners. Um, it's a clear differentiator. Patients want to let their neurosurgeons know that they're happy being able to finish in a week. Um, and it's also that it's evidence-based, data-driven, and value-oriented. And I'll usually discuss these cases with my colleagues, both pre- and post-operatively, to make sure we're all on the same page. And also with my medical oncology colleagues with regards to sequencing, I'll typically give my five-fraction regimens prior to any systemic therapy. And often it's done even before the oncotype is back. Um, and then in terms of workflow, as I said, I always discuss with the patient and surgeon preoperatively so I can talk to them about placing the Viriform at the time of surgery. Um, and then if seeing post-op, I'll discuss with the surgeons about whether or not I should be doing partial breast, whole breast based on what they've seen. Um, we simulate the patient and contour that area out. And you can see a case where I've contoured out the Viriform. Um, and then we use it for comb beam CT as well. I think the last point I want to make is really talking about rethinking de-intensification. I think when you think about all the studies that talk about de-intensification, like CALGB 9343 and PRIME2, they've focused on omitting radiation in lieu of endocrine therapy, but the calculus has changed. So those studies looked at the era of five weeks of whole breast radiation, and there, yeah, I think five weeks of daily radiation versus taking a pill every day, it makes sense to de-intensify against radiation. And if you look at, for example, BR7, which is a new energy trial looking at oncotype, it's gone back to that. But I guess my argument would be, why not think about no rate, sorry, radiation alone as an option in these cases. And the reason is, is that the pendulum is swung. We now have five fraction measurements and data showing consistently poor compliance with endocrine therapy. I think also one of the things I commonly hear is, oh, we have to give endocrine therapy because endocrine therapy reduces distant METs, which radiation doesn't in low risk patients. But if you go back to B21, in these low risk patients, there was no difference in distant metastases between endocrine therapy alone and radiation alone. So you see in Europe, there are ongoing trials looking at radiation alone as compared to endocrine therapy alone. And I would argue that if you can offer five fraction targeted radiation or five fraction whole breast, you're going to be a differentiator. And these may be patients who don't want endocrine therapy, who don't want the arthralgias, who don't want the hot flashes, the other side effects of endocrine therapy, who are going to say, you know what, a five fraction course of radiation is really the way to go for me. And in the bottom, you can see this is a study done by my colleague, Dr. Ward, with a group of us really looking at the idea of value-oriented thinking with de-intensification and showing that five-fraction partial breast is very much an appropriate choice. So in conclusion, five-fraction breast radiation is here to stay. It can be done with APBI with image guidance or whole breast radiation using image-guided boost approaches. Shrinking the number of fractions and the target is not only data-driven and value-oriented, but patient-driven. And at the end of the day, targeting is key to maximize the therapeutic ratio. At this time, I'll turn the slide projection over to Dr. Byer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, let me Sorry, I'm having a little problem getting my in my screen. There we go. You should be able to see the slide as the slide. Is that is that coming across clear? It is. Okay, thanks. So I, I've first of all, I want I want to thank Videra for putting this presentation on, giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Shaw because I don't think I have been involved in any presentation for the past 20 years where I have not been the one talking about payment policy. Um, and it was really refreshing to sit back and, and listen to Dr. Shaw share that with us. So I appreciate that. I'm gonna come at it with a slightly different approach and, and I'm gonna start with, you know, what is the problem with the status quo? And I'm, I'm not gonna be sharing you data on fractionation because I think Dr. Shaw did a phenomenal job of outlining what's what's out there now and what's new and what's important. Um, but what I want to do is talk about our contouring. So the contouring 
whether we're talking about breast boost or accelerated partial breast irradiation, it's really the same thing. It is deceptively easy, but I would argue this is the most imprecise task that we as radiation oncologists do. There's nothing that I do in my day that is as, as uncertain as contouring breast. We really want to contour as precise a, tar, a CTV as possible. Perhaps one of the reasons that it's really hard to show the benefit of a boost in so many series is that we don't know that we were hitting the target. We don't know that everyone was hitting the target. Um, we don't know that we were treating the entire tumor bed. We don't know that we were avoiding the normal tissue as much as possible. And unfortunately, in the breast, there are really no good anatomic landmarks. I mean, I've got, I've, I've got, uh, you know, atlases on my computer telling me how to draw lymph nodes here and, uh, you know, contour structures there. But there's really not a lot of good anatomic landmark for us to look at in breast because every breast is different, and everyone does it differently. And when I started in my career we boosted the scar. I came in with my magic marker and I drew the contour around the scar and we created a, an electron block for it. And it, it actually worked pretty well because the surgeons always put the scar over the tumor. But that doesn't happen anymore. Surgeons are now tunneling. They're putting the scar in places that make it uh, a better cosmetic outcome. And boosting the scar doesn't work. The other imaging doesn't help me that much. I mean, I can get to the quadrant from my mammogram, from my MRI, but it really doesn't help me to define exactly what my contour needs to be. The seroma, which is often used as the surrogate for the tumor bed, may or may not be present. Uh, it may be resolved depending on when we get to the patient. Um, and that, tum that seroma may extend to areas that are not the actual tumor bed. It may connect to the axillary dissection. It may connect to the path that the surgeon used uh, to get in there, but not be where the tumor bed was. There are lots of other things that people have tried and, and CLIPS is the, is the standard. They're cheap, they're readily available, everyone gets them. It, it, oftentimes we will see a patient that has one to three CLIPS my high school geometry teacher taught me one, you know, three clips is good to define a triangle, maybe a plane, but really not a three-dimensional volume. And, and here's an example. Um, this is a clip. Um, this is in the tumor bed. You can see on the, on the um, different planes, it's not far from some axillary clips. It's not far from what looks like a seroma. Uh, perhaps that's, uh, you know, that, that I should be contouring this whole thing, um, but perhaps not. And if you look at it on the, uh, um, on, on the coronal view, there are two clips and I, I'm just not entirely sure what I should be treating. Um, here's some clips. One of them I think is in the tumor bed. The other is in the axillary dissection. And I'm pretty sure that the other one is in the axillary this is the tumor bed, this is the axillary dissection. I'm pretty sure of that because this is the adjacent slice. And that kind of looks like axillary dissection to me. So it looks like I got one clip that I can rely on for tumor bed, three clips that are axillary dissection. And again, how much of that seroma do I really want to target for what was an eight millimeter, uh, eight millimeter uh, tumor? Um, the seroma, is, as we've alluded to, is not a great surrogate in, in most cases. And I, 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 you know, I, look, I look at this one and I've got two clips and they seem to outline an elliptical seroma. Perhaps that is in fact the, uh, uh, the, the, the tumor bed that I should be defining, but I'm really not sure. And when I look at the other breast, and, and this actually um, you know, is, is the same patient, this is the other breast that's normal. You could easily be fooled into contouring something that really just looks like a little density on the CT um, and you would be wrong. Um, this is a patient that wants partial breast radiation. I don't know how to contour that tumor bed. 
Um, her CT, CT shows these densities. Her mammogram shows very dense breasts. Um, and there's a lot of good reasons why partial breast is the right call for this lady. But how do you contour? Um, and I would argue we don't have a good idea of what the tumor bed should be using standard clips. Um, this is the veriform, and you can see on the uh, uh, image on your left, you can see the linearity of the, of the, uh, uh, of the veriform as it is looping around. Um, there are places where you see it in cross-section. It looks like a dot. There are other places you see it with this line, but it's very clear what is and what is not intended as the tumor bed here. There are other, other devices that have, are on the market uh, purpose-built to, you know, to define the cavity. Um, and they do come in different sizes, although they don't come in different shapes. Um, and, and here we've got a, you know, a, a nice cavity that's defined both by the seroma and by the uh, marker. Um, problem being number one, you know, is, is, the, is the seroma that shape because that's the shape of the, of the marker? I'm really not sure. Problem number two is six months later, the patient was still complaining she could feel this marker. Um, and it was something that we don't see with the veriform. Um, and there's other metal, there's other clips that might be in the breast that can be very confusing. Um, this is one where I don't, I don't know whether that clip is something that was adjacent, you know, the, the, the axillary dissection, which is not that far from this plane, uh, whether that's the area where there, there was a, a concern about the margin or whether that's just some hardware attached uh, to the breast prosthetic, because it looks like there's something on the other side as well. Um, and I, I know there was no clip there left as a signal to me. Um, this is a patient who's had multiple prior biopsies that were benign. And every time she has a biopsy, the mammographer places a clip. Um, and you, we use these in, in um, identifying uh, which is the current target. But these are left in place by the time I get to see the patient. And in fact, it doesn't look any different than a clip that was left intentionally for me. These clips were, th this clip that you see on the CT has nothing to do with the patient's current tumor. It has to do with one of these old biopsies. Um, again, a couple of views of the Veriform just to give you a sense of how it really does better define a three-dimensional volume. Um, here's one where there's absolutely no credible seroma left behind. But in fact, it's very easy to contour what is the tumor bed because the surgeon has left me enough information that I can, I can contour exactly what I need to treat. Um, here's one, again, same thing, veriform in, in this area of, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the breast and a lot of density that extends laterally and, and in this case, posteriorly from that tumor bed. And, and exactly where would you draw the line if all you had was a couple of clips? And the answer is you wouldn't know and you would, you would be tempted to over-treat rather, than, uh, rather than, than miss the tumor bed in this, in this patient. Um, this is axillary clips. Again, they don't look any different than the clips surgeon leaves me. This is a, a three-dimensional, excuse me, a, a, a video clip. And I wanna show it to you because the real beauty of the, of the Veriform as we're looking at it in the breast is best appreciated on a moving view. Uh, and I apologize for this motion, but here you can see as we scroll through it, very clear where the tumor bed is where the tumor bed isn't. You can see the confines of the tumor bed is here. And, and this tells me completely disregard all the densities that are down here because this is completely unrelated to anything to do with this patient's cancer. Um, so I also wanna share with you, uh, we've, you know, we've looked at these over time. Um, planning days C zero CT on the left, 
uh, day 48, and, and uh, before Dr. Shaw jumps on me, we did not treat this patient for 48 days. Um, in fact, this patient did have what, what I would consider the Canadian hypofractionation, um, but for some reason, and I don't remember the details, there was a delay uh, between simulation and treatment. But, but it was really good to know that over time, this is stable. You can see the same thing in the uh, coronal view. Uh, there's no question where, you know, where the tumor is at the time of, of treatment. And there's no question we can see that very clearly on the cone beam CT. Um, it's also nice because we, we don't interfere with subsequent mammography. There's no discomfort from the device being in the breast. Um, there's, we've had no complaints from our mammographers. They, they clearly know where the tumor used to be, but it does not interfere with their ability uh, to do the imaging that they need to do in future for these patients. So to, to wrap up, you know, changing paradigms in, in treatment really require us to have a better idea of where our PTV and CTV needs to be. We need to be as accurate in treating breast cancer as we are in head and neck cancer, as we are in lung cancer, as we are in prostate cancer. The existing technologies occasionally work. I won't, I, I, I won't say they don't, but most of the time they leave uncertainty. They set us up for a geographic miss. They set us up for overtreating normal tissues. And I, I, I think the Viriform has been very useful in defining a three-dimensional volume based on the surgeon's view of the tumor bed. It's easy to place at the time of surgery. It's unmistakable at the time of planning. Um, there's no confusion with other markers and there's really no question of the seroma. So with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Shaw. Um, and then we do have a couple of questions that are, uh, that are coming in. Um, and it, it maybe I'll, I'll throw the question out, and I, I think Dr. Yeah. Shaw, this first one is good for you. Can the Perfect. partial breast or APBI allow patients to start deciding which hospitals to choose? Do they see hospital? Do they see hospitals promote a shorter therapy similar to what we saw with robotic surgery? And I think that's uh, something you were alluding to um, that this this is a differentiator. So I'm going to let you tackle that. Yeah, I mean, I would say that this is, you know, clearly a differentiator. I think if you look at the data, the, you know, there aren't as many patients doing five fraction, whether it be partial breast or whole breast. Um, and I think it's data driven, particularly for the five fraction partial breast with 10 year data. I think, you know, obviously five fraction whole breast, um, the 10 year data wasn't powered for local control and the five fraction um, whole breast over five days only has five year data. But I think having a discussion with your patients about these options and when they're appropriate for you um, will clearly be a differentiator for your practice if you know they're going to other practices that aren't discussing these options. And that doesn't mean that that's for every patient, but talking and sometimes patients just wanna hear that those options are available and why they may or may not be candidates. Um, sure, I guess the next question is, can you expand on APM, the future of breast radiation therapy? What in your opinion uh, survives, IORT, brachy, et cetera? Um, it's a good question. I, I, I can't say that I have a perfect crystal ball, and I think obviously the APM is delayed and may be delayed further. Um, but in terms of, you know, looking at capitated structures um, that really are going to place a priority on value and data, um, things that allow for the delivery of efficient radiation therapy and comfortably, right? I think it's easy to just start doing five fractions, but if you don't feel comfortable contouring it, you may still do more fractions just because you don't feel comfortable doing it. Um, I think we're going to see much shorter courses, whether that be five fraction partial breast with some kind of image guidance like we talked about, or whether that be brachy with sometimes two or three day brachy regimens that are now being studied in, in prospective trials. Um, you know, with respect to IORT, I think it's been a, something that's been discussed a lot. The data has been less than stellar. If you look at the Elliott trial, high rates of recurrence. If you look at target A, we don't know what the tenure rate of local control in target A is right now. Um, so my, my take is IORT, not really a standard care option at this time. And hopefully, you know, we get more data to help clarify its position, but we just don't have that data now to tell us. I don't know if you have anything different on that, Dr. Byer. No, I, I was just, just going to say, we, we know that the APM is currently sitting in the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. Um, we know it was delayed. Um, there's a rumor circulating in Washington that it, it is going to be permanently delayed. I don't know 
whether that's the case or not. And, and so literally we are all just sitting around waiting for that. But, but clearly um, this, you know, if, if something like that goes through the model of how we as radiation oncologists get paid is turned upside down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it will cause a lot of rethinking. Um, and I think that there, there will be a lot more people fast to fast forward and it'll look a lot more attractive to people who are in the APM for sure. Yeah. Um, there's an anonymous uh, question here. If my breast surgeon only wants to use a few clips, how can I encourage him or her to use this technology? Um, and I don't know that there's a, a, a one size fits all answer to this, but I think it's really important uh, for us as radiation oncologists to have a real close working relationship with the breast surgeon. They, you know, they need to see what we do. They need to understand what we do. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't hesitate, you know, bring some, bring some pictures to your, you know, if you have a multidisciplinary breast conference, bring some pictures and show why, you know, why the clips leave questions in your mind. Um, you know, share what you, you know, the, the, you believe you could be treating less breast if you actually knew exactly where the tumor was or you, you know, how, however you want to word it. Um, but share with your, pay, you know, with your surgeon your experiences. Um, you don't control your surgeon. <laughs> we, we, we all know that. We, you know, we, we, we just have to come to our surgeons as, as professionals, as colleagues, um, and explain to them how they can make our life better. Because ultimately, it's about their patient. And, and if, we, if we can make that case, um, I think your surgeon would come around. I, I would agree. And thank you, Dr. Dupree, for all, having your surgeon, our surgeons call you. Um, you know, I think my takeaways, yeah, I, I work with my surgeons. I think we're all invested in the idea of doing the best for our patients. And, you know, I think one of the things surgeons hear feedback on is the side effects of, of what we do as radiation therapists. So if I can show my surgical colleagues ways that I can deliver my radiation therapy in a way that has less side effects, um, and that also makes them have to hear less about the sequelae of radiation. That's always going to go well for me. Um, and I think that's, you know, one of the things I've always worked with my colleagues on. Um, and I think this next question to the thoughts of auto contouring. I mean, I think auto contouring in breast cancer and all organs is kind of the way of the future. I think there's lots of platforms out there looking at auto contouring, everything from organs at risk to, you know, your breast volume itself. Um, and if I had to guess, I imagine that, yeah, there's going to be auto contouring targets created for partial breast using different image guidance platforms that's gonna be on the way. I think that's the future um, of radiation therapy, contouring and planning uh, in the years to come. Yeah, I'll just throw out, you know, I've, I've said this many times, but when I started in my career back in the 1980s, uh, contouring was not a thing. We, we didn't contour because there was, you know, rare patients that had a CT. And I expect that when I retire, contouring will no longer be a thing. Um, I think this is something AI is going to be very well suited for um, and will be able to help us do a lot of those time-consuming tasks um, that, that will leave us the time to take care of patients. Um, and then to Dr. Pang's comment, is there data that Viriform decreases risks of seroma or hematoma? So I can just tell you from my own experience, I don't think it makes the seroma disappear. I think it makes the seroma more compact. In my experience is what I've seen. I tend to see a little bit of seroma form around the viriform itself, but I don't see those large, huge circular seromas I see when there is no viriform. Obviously, that's not prospective data, but that's just my own experience. And I can't say I've seen any hematomas, but I'm not sure if there's any large prospective data there. Um, and similar to the other point, you know, about outcomes, comfort, and cosmesis, there are prospective studies under the way that will hopefully answer all of those questions for us. And I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Byer as well. Yeah, no, I, I would agree on, on both those points. I, I do think a lot of the seroma hematoma issue. Um, some of that's some of that is going to be surgical technique. Um, some of that is going to be just you know dumb luck. Some some patients are are going to are going to have problems and others are not. And it, and you can have the best surgeon in the in the world, um, and you still may have it. But I I don't think that that there should be a huge difference um, you know w w with the veriform because in fact it it really is just. Um, it's just defining that space, but it's not closing the space. Um, it's it's not like the sutures that are put that are put in to to close the cavity. So I, I 
I'd be surprised if there's a huge difference there. Yeah, and, and in my experience, it looks very similar to when a breast surgeon does um, basically tissue approximation post lumpectomy, but without a radio opaque. So then you'll see a very flattened seroma. Um, and that's what I see with the Viroform. It almost flattens the seroma up, but you can now see it, which you can't see with tissue approximation. Um, and it looks like Dr. Lee has, has posted a comment. Um, another option is to ask the surgeon to draw what they think the radongs are boosting um, and then show them the huge area and the imprecise. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a very good thought experiment and what people think we actually do when it comes to boosting and what the reality is. Um, I always talk about the wayward clip because that wayward clip may add 15, 20, 30% to your cavity which may or not be relevant, you just don't know. And so you're forced to make that decision. Whereas with the, with the Viroform, you don't have to. And, and, and again, it just emphasizes the importance of having a real good relationship with your surgeon. Yeah. Um, any other questions we can answer? Well, uh, I again want to thank you both Dr. Shah and Dr. Buyer for taking time this evening to walk through this. This is uh, just a terrific, comprehensive overview, and I, I really do appreciate that, as does Alex. Thank you so much. We appreciate I appreciate it, and it was great to see everyone on the call today. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a great, great audience. Thank you for the for the in, involvement with the questions and the participation, um, and thank you for giving us forty minutes of your evening. Indeed. All right. Have a good night, everybody, and thank you everyone for joining.